Sandra E.K. and I'm here with HIT 292 Healthcare Reimbursement. We are still on week 11. This is lecture video number four of six. So there's this one and two more to follow. Um, we are looking at Medicare, Medicaid, prospective payment systems for post-acute care, but now we are on LTACs or long-term care hospitals. So if you are looking at your syllabus, this is part of Unit Objectives 9.1.8, 9.1.14, and 9.4.1 through 9.4.11, 9.5.1 through 9.5.5, and 9.6.1 through 9.6.3. Alrighty, with that out of the way, if you want to follow along using your textbook, I would open to page 203, because that's where the LTAC start, part starts. I have been talking a lot today um, prior to recording, to this, recording this video, so please forgive me if my voice gets kind of crackly <clears throat> and breaks up a bit, or if I stopped for a sip of um, iced tea just to keep on going. All right, so our objectives according to the book for this part of Chapter 8 are to describe Medicare's prospective payment system for long-term care hospitals, differentiate the specialized collection, collection instruments that exist in post-acute care, explain the classification models and payment formulae associated with reimbursement under Medicare and Medicaid PPS systems, and then we have all sorts of key terms. And I don't know if I've mentioned this before, sorry, I've slept since the last lecture, but if you look in the back of your book, you have Appendix A, and it gives you, it's a glossary, and it gives you um, definitions for different terms that are in different colors in your book. So if you see this bluish, purplish, not sure what color you would call it, maybe periwinkle, a dark periwinkle. But anyway, um, those should be in the back in glossary in Appendix A, which starts on page 307. Um, there's also, in case you haven't looked, check your understanding answer key. And that starts on page 329 in the back of your book. So if you're doing those questions, that would be helpful to you. And then there's additional appendices. And we're actually going to get into those starting next week to give you a quick, quick preview of week 12 where we're going to get into some of that um, as we move forward. I think it's week 12. Let me double check. I need to tell you wrong. Yes, week 12, we're going to talk about the CMS 1500 form, da patient data, EDI transfer, payment for services, all those types of exciting things. Um, we will have those next week. All right, <clears throat> so background for LTAX. Um, Medicare beneficiaries, their long-term care hospitalizations covered under Part A Medicare. They have up to 90 days of hospital services within the benefit period. And it refers you back to Chapter 4 if you have questions about that. Admissions to both acute care hospitals and LTACs are counted in the benefit period. So that up to 90 days includes whether you're talking about acute care hospitals or these long-term care hospitals or LTACs. And it talks about the deductible and um, co-insurance payment and reserve days and on and on. And on. Good things to know, definitely. Um, Long-term care hospitals or LTACs, they treat groups of patients who have longer than average length of stays, um, typically 25 days or more. So their average length of stay has to be 25 days or more. These are our medically complex patients that need specialized care. Um, a lot of times they're on a vent, so that's part of why um, they're, they're doing this. Um, an example of a patient that might need an LTAC would be a patient that's in an acute care hospital and they're going to continue to need acute care services and specialized services that can't pre be provided in a skilled nursing facility but the acute care hospital needs to move them on. So that's when they're discharged from an acute care hospital and sent to a long-term care hospital or an LTAC um, for care. 
So um, a lot of times these are cancer patients, um, head trauma patients, um, vent dependent patients, those types of things. And so um, let's see what else. What's the next? Okay. Yes. There we go. All right. And it's Part A benefit. There is some cost sharing. There's an inpatient deductible. Um, there's some coinsurance, and I talked about reserve days. Case rate methodology. All costs for admission are included in one payment per admission. An exception would be like blood clotting factors, um, erythropoietin, erythropoietin, that type of thing. Um, but otherwise, this is a case rate methodology. And what, however long their stay is, that is what it is. Let's see what else. If there's, I was just flipping back here at your book um, to see if there's anything along that line that I needed to cover. But okay. So we talked about the average length of stay being 25 days or more for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, there are freestanding tax, but there are also satellite units within uh, acute care hospitals um, that are LTAC units. VA hospitals, demonstration project hospitals, extended neoplastic disease care hospitals, those are not included in LTAC PPS. Um, and neither, and the types of admissions that are excluded are if it's a psychiatric or rehab diagnosis that's principal for the stay. They're also not included if they didn't have a preceding inpatient admission. So uh, make sure that you're aware of that. And this is on the um, this is on the bottom of page 203 where it talks about um, to qualify as a long-term care admission, the principal for the principal diagnosis for the admission cannot be a psychiatric diagnosis or relate to a rehab diagnosis. Rather, these admissions are better suited for an inpatient psych facility or an inpatient rehab facility. And then in 2016, um, it started that only certain types of discharges from LTAX will qualify for the LTAC PPS payment. Non-qualifying discharges are paid under the IPPS for acute care hospitals. Either of two circumstances will qualify an LTAC discharge for payment. So this is what we really need to focus on. How do you know that the LTAC discharge is going to qualify for LTAC PPS? First of all, the patient had to have an immediately preceding acute care hospital stay that included at least three days of intensive care services. So. They have to have been in an acute care hospital in an intensive care for at least three days of service before coming to the LTAC in order to qualify for the LTAC PPS. They also, or, or if they didn't have that, they had to have an immediately preceding acute care hospital stay and the admission diagnosis, the admission principal diagnosis indicates that the patient received at least 96 hours of mechanical ventilation during the encounter. So to fall into LTAC PPS, make sure we got to make sure we're really clear on this. You either had to be in an acute care hospital with three days of intensive care, unit care, or you had to be in an acute care hospital. And then once you get to the LTAC, you have to have at least 96 hours of, of being on a vent. And that's what push, pushes you into the LTAC PPS um, system. If it's outside of that at an LTAC, these are called non-qualifying discharges, and they're paid under IPPS because remember LTACs are considered inpatient care, but they're site-neutral payments. The site-neutral payments are less of the IPPS amount or 100% of the discharge costs. So make sure that you understand all that process there. All right, data collection. They use the CARE data set. So anytime you see CARE, you want to be thinking LTAC. It's Continuity Assessment Record and Evaluation. 
So they require assessments to be completed for each patient. This is sort of like an MDS, but it's called CARE because it's specific to LTACs. And I'm sure we will cover that as the chapter goes on. Structure of payments. It's a standard federal base rate based on the LTAC cost reports with a wage index adjustment. The wage index adjusts the base rate and you apply the cost of living adjustment, the COLA, if you're in Alaska and Hawaii. So look at page 205, because this is gonna give you the steps that you need to know for LTAC PPS. The first step is you adjust for geographic factors. The second thing is you adjust for case mix. The third thing is the payment is determined. So make sure you know this. And notice too, the area wages, labor, the labor portion and the non-labor portion are different. Remember how in IPPS it was 75.25? Here it's 66.2 versus 33.8. So watch out for that. Medicare severity, long-term care diagnosis related groups. Anytime you see MS, LTC, DRGs, think LTAC. Do not think SNF, think LTAC. That's the, that, this is the, that's the grouper you're gonna use and the, and the set of DRGs that you're gonna use through the diagnoses and procedures to roll up into for payment. So make sure that you are familiar with that. And this is all covered, um, the, the MSLTC DRGs is on page 206, and it gives you some examples of, of the relative weights, MSLTAC DRG versus MSDRG, and you can see that they're not as high as they are in the acute care facilities. And then it crosses over into page 207 as well, where it goes into a little bit more detail. So some similarities to MSDRGs. Structurally, they are identical. They have same group numbers and titles, same information required to group admissions, but the differences are in the relative weights because there's a lesser resource consumption. And the distribution is different because LTACs don't treat a full range of conditions like acute care hospitals do. You're not gonna see um, maternity only visits at an LTAC. Um, you're not gonna see just a simple COPD visit at an LTAC. So there are some differences there that you wanna be aware of. So you've got your base rate times your MS, LTC, DRG, relative weight to equal payment. So make sure you're familiar with this. Hint, hint, there may be a question. I can't remember, but there might be. So, what else can happen when you're trying to look at payment? So we've talked about um, the base rate, and then we've talked about now the DRGs and relative weights. So when you get to reimburse, reimbursement, what kind of adjustments are we now talking? Well, you could have a short stay outlier where the admission is shorter than the average length of stay these are five-sixths of the geometric average length of stay. And they're paid at a blend of the IPPS amount and 120% of the MSLTC DRG per diem amount. So this is on the bottom of two, 207, top of 208, if you want to take a look at that there. An interrupted stay. What happens if they get admitted and then they're transferred to an acute care hospital or inpatient rehab facility or even a SNF? and then they're readmitted to the LTAC again. They're treated as one LTAC admission, not two. So make sure you know that. And each non-LTAC setting has day requirements. 
So an interrupted stay, an interrupted LTAC stay becomes one discharge and one payment. Just, just so you know. High cost outlier. If you have a di if there's an LTAC discharge that has extraordinarily high costs that exceed the typical costs of its MS LTC DRG, it falls into the high cost outlier. And to identify those, CMS has a threshold. It's based on adjusted federal payment plus the fixed loss amount. Each year, they um, publish that amount in the Federal Register. Yes, you've got it, the Federal Register. 25% rule. That reduces payments for HWH LTAX and satellite LTAX that exceed the 25% threshold for patients admitted from their host acute care hospitals during a cost reporting period. Well, let's go back and talk about that good old W, HWH. An HWH is a hospital within a hospital, and this definition is at the top of page 203 if you're looking at your book. And what this means is this is an LTAC unit within a hospital. So if it is one of these situations or a satellite LTAC, not an independent, but not an independent facility, these are different than an independent one, um, and they exceed that 25% threshold for patients admitted from their host acute care hospitals during a cost reporting period, then um, they're paid the lesser of the LTAC PPS rate or an amount equivalent to the IPPS rate for patients discharged from the host acute care hospital. What this is, is they're trying to make sure that LTAC units within hospitals or satellite LTAC units in a facility or organization don't function as units of acute care hospitals. They want them to function as LTACs because acute care hospitals and LTACs are totally different. They really are. And the more you research it, you'll realize that in terms of the patients that they care for and how they care for those patients. I mean, yes, they're still doing ventilator care and yes, they're still, um, you know, providing nursing care and taking vitals and doing medications and all those types of things. But, but their patient population should be clearly different. And that's what they're trying to do with this 25% rule. They're sort of holding the hospitals and healthcare organizations accountable for how they run their LTAC units. And that's what they're doing with this. All right, so payment steps. You've got that wage index adjustment, and don't forget, it is not 75.25. It's 66 point, is it 66 point, hang on. I don't want to forget and tell you wrong. 66.2 versus 33.8. So you've got the wage index adjustment, COLA if applicable, depending on if you're in a high, high, high cost of living type of area, and then you want to multiply it by your MS LTC DRG and apply any provisions. And those provisions we just talked about, there are four of them. All right, so that is all it has on the slideshow. We're now um, coming up to page 209 in your book. Make sure you do your check your understanding questions to help you study. Make sure you're familiar with all the terms that are in that other bluish purplish color. Um, make sure that you understand about LTAC reimbursement, how that works, and what the formula is, and how the um, wage labor adjustment is all done. And I like figure 8.6 in your book, where it compares an acute care hospital and long-term care hospital and shows you the DRG. I think that's, that's helpful. All right, this one was a nice short one. I am coming back to you with the next video, which is on inpatient rehab facility perspective payment. So I will be right back shortly. Don't run away too far, okay? Where's my mouse gone? I lost my mouse.